So uh, we'll be going through just a couple verses here in uh, Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, it's actually kind of funny. It's a short lesson. And uh, <laughs> I did not know that uh, there were going to be other, so many other things cut out tonight uh, before I made it a short lesson. So uh, it's very common when people are talking to their kids or, you know, whatever, to try and kind of threaten their kids to do what they want, right? You know what I'm talking about, right? And a lot of times I think that we kind of go to God with the same idea that he's just, you know, that overbearing parent that's just kind of trying to nag us to death or threaten us and, you know, kind of bully us and whatnot. And uh, the, new co- the New Covenant, though, has a much different approach from the Old Covenant, which is exactly what he's going to bring up um, uh, in this section that we're looking at tonight. So he's already talked about the punishments and all that stuff, and he's going to start talking about some other things. Um, and even when there are kind of, uh, I guess you could say, the threats, uh, they really aren't threats. They're more of just warnings, kind of like a speed limit warning. <laughs> you know, it's not really something that uh, I think has that same idea. But once again, the problem being that when we've had that bad experience in our own life or, or we know someone who's done that, we kind of start seeing that in God, even though it's not really in him. So to review what we looked at last week, uh, faith requires a God element and a people element. Um, there's a lot of very good stuff that we looked there, but let's not repeat what we've already looked at. Um, so we'll start in verse, go ahead and go to the next uh, slide there, buddy. We'll start in verse 18 and read through 24. Uh, can I have someone read this section? You have not come to a physical mountain, to a place of flaming fire, darkness, gloom, and whirlwind, as the Israelites did at Mount Sinai. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. Moses himself was so frightened at the sight that he said, I am terrified and trembling. No, you have come to Mount Zion, uh, Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to countless thousands of angels in a joyful gathering. You have come to the assembly of God's firstborn children, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God himself, who is the judge over all things. You have come to the spirits of the righteous ones in heaven, who have now been made perfect. You have come to the to Jesus, the one who meditates, um, med- mediates the new covenant between God and people, and to the s- um, sprinkled blood, which speaks of forgiveness instead of crying out for vengeance like the blood of Abel. Go to the next slide there, buddy. So that was in the NLT, which I think is a very uh, user-friendly translation. Uh, And we did that in that, well, (laughs) we did it in that because I forgot to change the (laughs) translation on the Bible Gateway. However, after I had already added it, I thought, you know, I'm going to go ahead and leave it because I think that it said some things in just some real down-to-earth kind of ways. So uh, as we're looking at these verses here, <coughs> we l- remember last week we were talking about how we are making sure that none of us has an evil, immoral heart. Remember all that? Well, I think sometimes when we read that, we can have this idea of basically – it's my job to test everyone else. But I don't think that's what he's saying. I don't think he's saying, let's have a critical eye to everyone else, because that really just flies in the face of the rest of Scripture. I think what he's saying is, we're, we're kind of testing, each of us, we're all testing ourselves, you know, making sure that there's no evil in it. And what, so what does that look like? It's not necessarily me just, like, sitting with a critical eye on everybody else. It's me actually kind of weighing myself and also connecting with each other, and we're kind of making sure we're in line with what we should be doing. Um, uh, because this is so much... Uh, bigger. Um, this is so much bigger than what was in the Old Testament. So uh, I don't know if you guys remember, but when we started Hebrews a long, long time ago, many moons ago, many moons ago, uh, we start, I brought up the, the fact that there's a lot of what's called a lesser to greater argument, and this passage here is going ha- to kind of rely heavily on that. So <coughs> when you go to the next slide there, buddy, verse 18, it says, For you have not come to what could be touched, and this is the CSB here, uh, to a blazing fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm. Next slide. Uh, to the blast of a trumpet and the sound of words. Those who heard it begged that not another word be spoken to them. 
So uh, you guys are all probably pretty familiar with, with uh, where th- what this is referencing, but we'll just kind of make sure we're all on the same page. Um, and so he gives us a list of seven things. I call them the seven terrors, if you want to go to the next slide. Yeah, there you go. Uh, seven things in the Old Testament that Moses, um, in the Old Testament with Moses, um, about the Old Testament, if, uh, Old Covenant, however you want to say that. Uh, but uh, the the seven things aren't going to be just from when the covenant was established in Exodus 19. It's also going to be from when it was reestablished when the um, the whole golden calf incident. Um, God was going to wipe out the people of Israel, but instead Moses talks him into reestablishing the covenant. So he's, uh, these seven things come from kind of both those lists um, together. But both of them are in, in Exodus. The first thing he mentions is some th- things that could be touched or, or could or couldn't be touched. So the, the obvious um, reference here uh, is to Mount Sinai uh, because, remember, uh, the, God said, okay, here's the border of the mountain. Nobody touched the mountain. Nobody's animal touched the mountain. You just kind of stay clear of it. But, uh, you know, there's other things that um, it kind of conjures in our imagination. The, the tablets that the uh, law was written on, for instance, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, uh, the list of unclean and clean things that could and couldn't be touched. So there's a lot of different things that, that are brought into our imagination. But I think uh, Mount Sinai is probably the, the foremost thing that's being mentioned because he's going to start talking about Mount um, Zion in the next little paragraph down. So uh, the second thing he mentions is burning with fire. Uh, this obviously refers to a couple different things. Um, first off, there was, if you'll remember the pillar of fire that, that followed Israel, but that's not primarily what it's talking about. It's talking about the mountain itself burning with fire. Um, and this was actually a reference from Deuteronomy that, sa- that describes the mountain as blazing with fire. Um, it's not in, I don't believe it says that in Exodus. It only says that in Deuteronomy. The third thing it says is darkness, and the th- uh, fourth thing is gloom, and the fifth thing is storm. Uh, these things are kind of all in a list, and these are things that are specifically mentioned in both Exodus and Deuteron- Deuteronomy in in um, uh, describing the um, covenant event where where God is is showing Himself very real on the mountain. There's all these uh, all these terrifying things happening um, as He's establishing His um, His covenant with Israel. Now, the, of the three things mentioned here, gloom, storm, and, uh, I'm sorry, darkness, gloom, and storm, gloom isn't actually specifically mentioned in the Old Testament uh, in Exodus 19. Um, this is more something that is added in the, in, in, Hebrew, in the book of Hebrews. And the reason why it is added apparently is just more for better flow in the Greek language. Um, there's a term for this. It's where you make, I'm not going to get into that, but it's where you make things kind of sound better in, in the way that they flow. And we know that the author of Hebrews was a very, um, uh, what do you say, learned person, a very educated person. Um, so he just a- kind of adds that in to, to keep with the flow in Greek. So, but the idea here, I think, is important because even though it's not specifically said gloom in, ex- in Exodus or Deuteronomy, uh, there's a very, a very important idea, and that's that the idea of gloom being more of an emotional heaviness, you know. Darkness describes, that can be like, I can turn off the lights in here, it'll be dark. But it's not necessarily gloomy, right? But you've walked into a house, like, after somebody's lost a loved one, you know, and there's just kind of, it's, the lights are on, it just kind of feels gloomy in the house. Uh, gloom has a whole different idea to it. It has that, that emotional heaviness to it. It's more than just dark. Um, and, and I think that that pretty much encapsulates, uh, that doesn't sound like the right word, um, Maybe it is the right word. It pretty much is a good defining word for what was wrong with the Old Testament um, law and the covenant, especially as it applies here. So we get to the sixth thing, which was, and did you go to the next slide there, buddy? I think this is a blank if you want to fill that in right there. Emotional happiness. <coughs> if, so then the fi- sixth thing. The sixth thing it says is the blast of the trumpet, the trumpet blast. Um, obviously, this is an o- more of an auditory experience, not something they really saw. Um, but it's mentioned very specifically in Exodus. When they get to Mount Sinai on the third day, um, there's, a, there's a trumpet blast, and it gets very, very loud, and it kind of scares, scares the willies out of, peop- out of the people. Um, and then the seventh thing was kind of right in line with that, the voice that was speaking, which I just now realize is lowercase. Oh, I hate that. Oh, and so is darkness. Oh, I did it twice. Oh, I don't like that. It's because I didn't hit enter on the thing. Oh, that's terrible. Okay, just pretend like it's capital. Okay, guys, just pretend. Pretend. 
Um, so this is obviously re referencing the exact, this, all seven of these things are things that are happening right around the same time in, in Exodus. Um, and so God is speaking directly to them at first, but it was very ter terrifying for them. So they specifically requested, please stop that, uh, that he only speaks through Moses, which is interesting because, yeah, God starts speaking to them through Moses. And then what do they do? <laughs> They start fighting with Moses about <laughs> what he says, you know, oh, Moses, you're just, you know, being prideful and arrogant. And so they have all this rebellion and stuff. And it's like, well, you guys are the ones who wanted him to talk instead of just listening to God. Eh, whatever. So then you get to verse 20 and it says, it's on the next slide there, buddy. Uh, for they, yeah, there it is. For they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be sown. Now, this verse didn't really make sense to me. But when you when you stop and think about it and read the verses together, it, it makes a lot more sense. What he's saying is it wasn't just the voice that terrified the people. It was a loud noise, which was scary, right? Have you guys ever been camping and there's just such loud lightning uh, uh, thunder that it's just like it wakes you up and you're just like, this is terrifying. I can't get out of this. I'm in the middle of the woods. <laughs> Have you guys ever, ever experienced that? <laughs> it's very intense. It's not just the fact that God's voice was there and it was very loud and very booming. It says very clearly for... They could not bear what was commanded. And it makes it sound like, okay, so hold on. You're scared of God's voice because you can't stand not going on the mountain? I don't think that's what he's saying at all. Um, see, God established the mountain as a barrier for their safety. Don't go on the mountain. You won't die. Keep your animals off the ma mountain. They won't die. Everything's going to be fine. But when God started talking, they got afraid anyways. And that is, and go to the next slide there, buddy, because this is kind of an interesting idea. There, there's two very important ideas from this passage. This is the first one. Their fear was greater than their faith. Okay, so, so, so God told them, don't come on the mountain and you won't die. But when God started speaking, <laughs> forget that. <laughs> don't speak to us anymore. Talk to Moses instead. You know, it didn't matter even though God told them, stay off the mountain, you'll be okay. And so their the, the, the fear was greater than their faith. And the idea is that this, and you can go to the next slide, Micah. Maybe God was going to break the barrier that he set for himself, or somehow they were going to accidentally get too close, which is really the heart of the problem. Was God going to cross his own line? He made this line on the mountain so we wouldn't die. It is, is this, is, this voice is so loud and so terrifying. Maybe he's going to cross his own line and we're going to die. So for they could not bear what was commanded, if even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned. Maybe we're not going to be so safe. Uh, okay, so then we get to verse 21, which is on the next slide. Yeah, oh, you're already there. Man, boy, oh, boy. Mike is on fire. Which says, the appearance was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. Now, this is why I specifically mentioned that it's not just talking about the initial uh, covenant that was formed in Exodus 19, but also when it was kind of reestablished a couple later, a couple chapters later with the golden calf, because the part of Deuteronomy that specifically says that Moses, this part about Moses trembling with fear, is actually talking about when they worshipped the idol, and God's wrath was like He wanted to wipe them out, <laughs> and that's where Moses is talking about. I'm trembling with fear. This is a very intense thing that's happening, and he only says it in Deuteronomy. Exodus never really clarifies whether Moses was scared or not. But uh, I think we could probably safely assume it was kind of terrifying. <laughs> I don't know, maybe I'm reading too much in there. But uh, so, in uh, the, uh, a bigger idea to this, which is is kind of a, an interesting thing to ponder, is that even Moses, who's the mediator of the old covenant, okay, the the one who 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 brought it down from the mountain, even this guy was afraid. So the law of judgment, the Old Testament covenant. Okay, the one who mediated it was afraid himself. You get what I'm saying here? Like how, how interesting of an idea this is? See, when Jesus brought the new covenant, it wasn't brought with fear. But when the Old Testament, when the old covenant was brought, it was given with fear. When Jesus gave us a new covenant, he wasn't afraid of what he was doing. But when Moses brought down the law, he was afraid. See, o the Old Covenant is a foundation of fear, and the New Covenant is not. Now, I bring that up because it's going to mention something here in just a minute that's kind of important for that. So when we get to verse 22, go to the next slide. One more. There it is. It says, Instead, you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God. 
the heavenly Jerusalem to myriads of angels and festive, a festive gathering. Now, the CSB kind of makes it sound like a festive gathering is separate from the myriads of angels, but that's not the case. Um, the angels are, there's a, a, a throng of angels having a celebration, if, if you understand what, what, it, what it's saying there. So uh, then it says in the next verse, to the assembly of the firstborn whose names have been written in heaven, to a judge who is God of all, to the spirits of righteousness, people made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood, which says better things than the blood of Abel. And most translations are going to say something there about saying something better than the blood of Abel. So that's, that's going to be the second uh, of those things, uh, kind of really big ideas in this section. But let's kind of keep it in the right order here. Um, first off, go to the next slide there. Oh, you already got it. In terror, the terror and separation from the old covenant isn't for us in the new covenant period. It's not for us. Uh, the terror and, and, and all that, and the separation from God, that's something that was foundational to the old covenant. It isn't something that is meant for us uh, nowadays. Obviously, that's not to say that there is no fear of the Lord whatsoever. But we're going to have to come back to that later because it's just kind of outside of the scope of what we're talking about tonight. Um, yeah, there's just there's no way. But oftentimes, I've noticed that a lot of times in the modern day church today, th- there's kind of more of an emphasis on the terror of punishment than on the joy of mercy and salvation, and. I want to just take a minute for each of us. Don't don't give an answer publicly. I just want for each of us to think and write down what you think is true of you. If you go to the next slide, there, oh, there we go. There we are. Got it. Uh, are you terrified of God's wrath or are you overjoyed by His grace? What's your typical go-to? Uh, once again, don't don't answer publicly. Just think about this. Are you fearful of the wrath or overjoyed by the grace? I am convinced that if our relationship with the gospel is one of fear from the wrath, if it's based on that, just based on the fear, we're missing the true mercy and beauty of the gospel. Not to say, once again, that there shouldn't be fear of wrath and all that stuff, and, or fear of God, or any of those things. I'm, I'm not saying that at all. I mean, Paul talks about the wrath of God, absolutely. But I think that the foundation of our salvation is more based on the, the, the joy of that grace. So... So now he's going to give us, or he gave us, not is going to, he already did it, uh, seven, uh, seven things in the New Te- Testament that contrast the Old, old Covenant. Um, and m- these seven things are going to be based mostly um, not on temporary and physical terms. They're going to be focused more on the eternal things. But I just simply called them the seven joys, okay? And I'll break them down in just a minute, but the, but there's a, the ideas of them. The city of God, the joyful angels, the firstborn, the good judge, the righteous, Jesus, and accusation gone. So to break that down further, the first one that is mentioned is Mount Zion, um, rather than Mount Sinai where the law was given. What? Okay, I see what. Yeah, pretend like the four on the second one. You're right, buddy. Um, why I did that is because I told it to start four on the right-hand side, and then I just copied it from the other one and pasted it here so I wouldn't have to remake a whole other PowerPoint slide. And so then I forgot to redo the numbers, so I kept it as four, even though I added the other one to this side, so it made it four or four. So there is seven on the list. It just says six. Uh, so, okay. Um, the first thing he m- mentions is the city of God. He mentions is Mount Zion. Um, this is in contrast to Mount, S- Mount uh, Sinai, where the, where the old covenant was given. Uh, and he calls it the holy city of the living God. Um, sometimes he calls it um, the, the new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem. The idea is basically the same, th- the same, either whichever way you do. We're not talking about a physical location here on earth. We're talking about something transcendent. And in the Old Testament references, um, it's... Not exclusive, but many times, um, many times that uh, Mount Zion is is mentioned. It's mentioned in connection with with the new the New Jerusalem. It's not always mentioned though. <coughs> um, either way, uh, whether whether you have the ideas connected or not, um, in the n- in the new heavens and new earth, you're going to see um, God dwelling with His people. Um, and you could say, well, where is He dwelling? In on Mount Zion or in the New Jerusalem? Um, regardless of whether those two places are like together or not, remember God is probably going to be in both places at the same time, so it's not really that huge of an issue, I guess. Um, and the second thing he mentions is the joyful gathering of angels. 
Um, and the word here for joyful, if I remember correctly, I believe this is the only place in the New Testament that it, this word is used. Um, it kind of has the idea of like a celebration. Like if you want to think of um, uh, when you go to like the, I was going to say the Hunger Games, but that's that that's that movie. Uh, not that. Uh, the Olympics, the Olympic Games. And there's like the celebration. That's kind of the idea um, of the word. So uh, Big big idea here is just that there is there is a celebration in mind. So then the third thing that's mentioned is the firstborn. Now it sounds like two of these things are the same, the firstborn and the righteous, but they're not. Um, the firstborn are more mentioned as God's followers, the children of God from the new covenant period. Um, I don't think it's it's stepping too far to draw this big of a separation here. But the idea is that these people eternally belong. They have the, their names written in the book of life. Um, and they're called the firstborn because they share the inheritance of the firstborn, Jesus Christ. Um, these are the people of the later covenant, like I said. But when you get to number five, uh, where it says, this, or number four, part two, <laughs> it says... Um, the spirits of the righteous, and these would be those of the former covenant, the righteous people before they were part of the new covenant. Um, and then the fourth one, the actual fourth one, is um, the good judge, which is right in the middle of the list, um, w- which I think is very telling, because when we think of judgment, we think of punishment. And I don't think that those two are necessarily... I don't, I don't feel like every time that judgment is being talked about, it is always talking about punishment, the negative idea of judgment. And then there's also a positive idea. And I think here is exactly what is a good, is a good example of that. Um, the good judge is giving good judgment, but also he's bringing salvation to people who, who trust. Um, so for, for, for the people who, who rest in God, who trust in God, this is not a fearful thing. With, with Jesus, think of vindication as in mind. You go before the judge and they say, you're free to go. It's not, it's not a, a, a bad time. It's a good time. And uh, I think that's exactly what's going on here. Um, there's some reasons uh, based off of context and, and also the language, but I'm just going to surpa- not surpass, uh, detour all that. Uh, what's it called? What? Mm, no, whatever. As, as long as you get the idea that I'm saying, it doesn't really matter, I guess. Um, and so the sixth thing would be um, Jesus, the Redeemer, uh, versus Moses, the Punisher. So you have a whole different idea there. With Moses, there was death. With Jesus, there was life. With Moses, there was punishment. With, with Jesus, there's life. So there's all this, this, this whole different idea there. Um, and then the seventh thing, which is sixth on the list, uh, is the cleansing blood of mercy. The, the, the idea that your, actions, that your, your guilt is gone, your, your, the, the accusatory voice of death and sin is gone. And this one is one that, especially in most translations, it was really getting confusing because it says this, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood, which says better things. How in the world can blood speak? And I think a a really good way of saying that is just saying this. Jesus' blood is cleansing blood of mercy. When Jesus died, even though he was um, sinless and murdered unjustly, his blood applied to us, which is given from him freely, cries out mercy for us. It doesn't cry out vengeance, get the guilty. But Abel's blood, on the other hand, w- was a lot different. It was an accusatory blood. It was one that when it was spilled, it was one that testified of murder and sin. And so there was no justice there. And even when, when God goes and talks to Cain, he doesn't really bring um, let me word this very carefully, but he doesn't really bring justice in the sense that he's going to talk about justice later on where he says every time that somebody takes a life, their life is required from them. That's not what he did with Cain. He let Cain live and he let Cain go away, and all he really did was kind of um, exile him, if you want to say it like that. Um, there were some other things, but we're just not going to get really uh, into that. But the idea being that, that Abel's blood was never atoned for. And see, this is kind of a contrast between the two blood sources. Jesus and Abel were both Christ figures in that they both died for being righteous, right? But uh, Abel's blood obviously didn't bring um, salvation. Rather, Abel's blood was a constant reminder and weight to God of, uh, of, of injustice, something that God even still carries in a way, uh, whereas Jesus' blood is, doesn't have that. So um, um, I guess what I'm saying here is just a real simple way of saying that is Abel's blood is um, kind of a symbol for uh, uh, sin's accusation towards us. 
you know, when we do something bad versus Jesus' blood, which doesn't do that. So, okay. Uh, last thing I want to say before we wrap up here. Um, so all these things, when you look at, when you look at this, this short little pa- this short little section here, it talks about basically contrasting the two mountains, Mount Sinai versus Mount, Mount Zion. And the two tones of the two mountains are totally different. Mount Sinai's tone was very negative. You've got gloom and darkness and, you know, all these negative words and, and, and ideas of, 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 of punishment and, and just bad things. Then you get over to the list from Mount Zion, and it's just a bunch of good things. It's like it's seven complete contrasting things where it's talking about all the good stuff of it. You know, standing before the judge and not being afraid. It's, it's, it's mentioned as a good thing here. Uh, you know, the people having their names written in the book of life. You know, the spirits of the righteous. The, joy, the angels are rejoicing rather than in the Old Testament where they couldn't even come to the mountain because it was such a frightful thing. It's a terrifying thing with the loud sounds and all this terrifying stuff. They're shying away. Here, it's like a complete, you're welcome here. You know, Mount Zion is calling you in, whereas my, Mount Sinai was pushing you out. You know, you're not good enough, whereas Mount Zion is saying, hey, you can, you can come here. You know, totally different tone. Um, so I guess you could say that uh, uh, Zion is the anti-Sinai, a welcoming place, whereas Sinai was more of a um, foreboding place. So the summary of everything we looked at, um, the new covenant welcomes us in. I think that's a good way of summarizing this. goes from verses 18 through 24. Uh, and then next week we'll finish up chapter 12, and we'll be on the last chapter of Hebrews. Um, I have an announcement to say about that. I totally forgot to mention that, but I'll say that in just a second. Before we get there, any questions uh, from the, any questions from anything we looked at or talked about, something that didn't make sense, anything like that? Okay. If you think of anything later, make sure to put it in the question box, and we will make sure to look at it.